box and I'll, I'll call that out to Brian. So it is 1030 U.S. Eastern time. Um, we've got a good crowd in here, and I think people are going to continue to join for the next couple minutes, but um, why don't we just get started? So welcome to our, our monthly webinar. Um, this is Dean Smith from the Community of Human and Organizational Learning, and um, today I am thrilled to introduce Brian Jestring from 4 and 6 Services, and Brian is going to share um, quite a bit, but I think, Brian, and you can fine tune this as we go, but I'm intrigued by your discussion around what you've learned about root cause analysis um, through your experience in forensic science. And I think it's a very intriguing topic and looking forward to it. So, Brian, the floor is yours. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, at any point, again, as I mentioned, the number is up in the corner here if you want to jot something down and get back to it. But at any point, just let Dean know and we, we can stop. I'll keep it very informal. So um, during your annual meeting, Todd actually gave a really compelling um, keynote, and he talked about the world changing. And it made me think, how many events have actually changed the world? And it's actually not as many as you think. And, and my definition of what changed the world is something that actually changed our behavior. So, you know, there's the, the things with technology, you know, the printing press, uh, the telegraph, the telephone, uh, personal computers, uh, cell phones now, unfortunately, morphing into mobile devices. You know, God, I'm old enough to remember when I went out of the house without a phone, and that was such a great feeling. Now, if you walk out of the phone, everyone starts shivering like something bad's going to happen. And unfortunately, the internet, which is, you know, both a tool of uh, amazing ability and also something that has really disabled us in a lot of different ways. But when we look at these initial things, we see that a lot of them are technologically driven, and they're driven in such a way that uh, it's causing us to interact with the world around us differently and the world to interact with us differently. And that's what's physically changing our behavior. Uh, more, more recently, we're seeing that, you know, really bad things are also changing our behavior. You know, 9-11, people remember where they were on 9-11 and everyone uses this line that, you know, that was a defining line and everything's been different since then. And, and now we're all going through this global pandemic. And here's just this really dramatic photo of trailers of bodies right at the foot of the Statue of Liberty. It's actually a little misleading because uh, this is actually in Jersey City, the Statue of Liberty is off on its own little island. But uh, when, when, when we look at this, I started thinking about it more and 9-11 clearly changed our behavior, but did is COVID changing our behavior? And, and that's kind of a wacky question to ask because when you look at the consequence of COVID and what I mean by the consequence, let's look just bare at the thing that is very stark, which is the death toll. And as of this morning, if you go to this website called Worldometer, you know, almost four and a half million people globally have died. Almost four and a half million people. Uh, almost 650,000 within the United States alone, just within the United States. And just to put that in context, that's greater than the number of soldiers killed in World War II, which according to the, World War, the National World War II Museum was 407,000. Uh, 200 times greater than the people that died on 9-11. And on certain days of the pandemic, there was actually more people dying of COVID than on 9-11. So how could it be that an event that is so serious and so stark is not changing our behavior? And you might disagree with me, but the objective evidence I want to give you has to do with PPE, personal protective attire. So at the height of the pandemic, the people that were on the front lines fighting in emergency rooms and first responders were totally strapped for personal protective attire. And they were doing whatever they could. They were reusing gloves that they shouldn't. They were reusing masks that they shouldn't. You see here using plastic bags. So American manufacturers stepped up because the reason these, these shortfalls came is because supply lines were shut because of COVID and they ramped up production and they ended up getting stomped for it. And what do I mean by that? Well, now they've ramped up all this production and everyone's going away again because as soon as the China line opens up again, everyone's running back to it. So it's one of these situations where how stark does it have to get before we change our behavior? And there's a great quote from this one executive. They want to have the cheapest prices. They want China prices, but then they want American manufacturers to bail them out when they can't get Chinese products. And it doesn't work that way. So I'm just looking and saying, okay, we're looking at this whole COVID process and it's not changing our behavior. Why is it not changing our behavior? And I think the reason 9-11 changed our behavior and COVID did not had to do with visibility. No matter where you were, if you were alive and you saw images of 9-11 flooded into your house, 
they were everywhere. They were on the news. If you didn't watch TV, they were on the radio. If you didn't listen to the radio, walked by a newsstand, they were everywhere. The horrors, the tragedy of this event that happened were visible to everybody. And while we hear about COVID and while we hear about these great numbers, it, it's almost to the point where we can't comprehend what's happening. We can't see it. It's not visible enough to us. And as an old adage, I think was attributed to Stalin, but I really don't think it was him just doing some quick historical research that the death of one man is a tragedy, but the death of a million is a statistic. And it's horrible, but I think COVID is really showing that to be true because is it truly changing our behavior? Is it visible enough? So what does any of this have to do with forensic science and failures within forensic science? Well, the question I have for you is, are the failures in forensic science visible enough? When someone spends 33 years in jail for something based on science that was never valid in the first place, when labs are closing in Nassau County, New York, and Detroit, Michigan, when all sorts of work is happening because of dry labbing or all sorts of things are happening in different places from Anchorage to New York to Seattle, um, when the National Academy of Sciences is saying that work that the FBI has been doing for years didn't have the scientific foundation to work. Uh, wherever you go, you're seeing these events popping up, popping up, popping up. What level of visibility do we need to change? Are we at the point yet where all these problems are such that we will reach this tipping point? And when I mean reach a tipping point, when we look and say, this is not acceptable. This is a, something we have to do something about this. So using the analogy of where we started, um, are we at a place where it's visible enough to change our behavior? And, and this is really overwhelming because you look and there's a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of different root causes for all these different failures that happened, but there are some commonalities and there's some commonalities throughout history. And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to take a little 211 year journey through history of forensic science, history of science, and, and kind of come and put it in perspective so you can see how we got there. And to a degree, this is overwhelming. But the good news is, like the fortune cookie says, all great journeys start with a single step, and we're taking that step. And thank you for being here this morning to actually take that step with me, talking about the challenges that are associated with failure analysis within forensic science. Just giving you a quick uh, little bio about me. You know, I've been in the field for 30 years. Before I was a consultant, I have been a crime scene investigator, a bench level analyst. I was a supervisor and manager in some of the largest and busiest crime labs in this country. And also I managed an accreditation program for an entire state. I was also an academic teaching undergraduate and graduate work in forensic science and directed a forensic science program at a university. So with all that type of fun stuff over with, how did we get here? So in order to understand where we're going, we really have to take an idea of how did we end up where we were? So in order to do that, I think we have to take that little ride back in history. And luckily I booked us a little trip this morning so we can actually jump on board and take a ride through history. So we'll just set the time back. We're gonna go back to 1811, December 17th, 1811, and we're gonna head over to France. So I'm sure everyone from all over the world, the person in Malaysia, whatever, you didn't expect to go into France this morning. So buckle up, here we go, we're off. So when we start looking at police work and specifically the emergence of the detective, uh, in the early 1800s, the policing in general was just an organized militia and it just was there to keep the peace. And even if you look at what the Metropolitan Police Forces logo is, it's keeping the Queen's peace. It's really always been that. That police forces started as trying to keep the organized masses down and try and keep order. Uh, not much more sophisticated than that. This kind of changed in 1811 with Eugene Francis Vidoc. Uh, Vidoc was an interesting character because um, he, in addition to being, you know, a womanizer, a deserter from the military, a career criminal, um, he was also a very smart guy. And in 1809, he watched one of his friends getting executed for his life of crime and said, man, this is probably not the way I wanna go. So he approached the warden of the jail he was in and said, listen, I can help you. And he organized a plainclothes division of snitches pretty much in jail that turned into the first plainclothes detectives, the first plainclothes police officers. And this is 1811. And it's nothing like the detectives we know right now. We can actually thank Edgar Allan Poe with C. Augustine Dupin, who was, came out in 1841, who was the first real scientific de or first real detective where he sat in his little flat. And as he sat in his flat, people brought him evidence and he objectively looked at the evidence and not the he said, she said, but actually the physical evidence that was there as well as the he said, she said, he weighed it all and he solved these crimes. And that was an amazing inspiration that actually led to detective bureaus around the world rank just appearing. You know, in the UK and New York City, I could show you badges and shields around the world, but really 
Um, obviously, Vidoc gets the credit for being the first person that pulls the police department away from this organized militia. But Edgar Allan Poe, this fictional influence, really influenced our reality and the police detectives. Now, what about the scientific detective? Well, that all traces back to one specific person, believe it or not. And you might not know the name, but you know, you know the person, and I'll tell you why. This is Dr. Joseph Bell. And Dr. Joseph Bell was a surgeon in Edinburgh, and he also taught at the medical college and ran a, surg a surgical clinic. In 1877, he took on a young medical student to assist him, and that young medical student was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And Conan Doyle was constantly amazed at how Joseph Bell and if anyone's interested, I can put them to some extra reading on this because it's really fascinating. Real life stories of how uh, patients would walk into Bell's clinic and Doyle would be helping him. And as he stood there, Conan Doyle would look at him, diagnose the problem, tell what the person did for a living, and actually tell where they came from within seconds, just on some basic observations. Sound familiar? Because it is. This is Sherlock Holmes. This is the real Sherlock Holmes. So when you actually combine C. Augustine Dupin, that detective and the first real scientific detective, even if it might be fictional, it really influenced someone in real life again, where fiction is influencing fact. And this was a guy named Hans Gross. Hans Gross was a magistrate in Austria and Upper Styria, and he was completely frustrated with the level of evidence that was coming into his courtroom. Uh, it was a situation where it was all he said, she said, and essentially it was garbage. So inspired by the works of Sherlock Holmes and what he saw with Poe's Dupin, and he actually saw that there was validity to what Holmes' Holmes's stuff was. He actually created a book, a manual for criminal investigators, magistrates, police officers, and lawyers. Came out in 1893 and really changed everything. And then in 1924, changed into English and actually just strangely republished in 2016. But if you're really looking for something interesting to read, it's 16 bucks on Amazon. You really can't go wrong. I strongly suggest you get it. But he actually created this term criminalistics, which encompasses one of the fields of forensic science that I'm actually involved in. So now if you take, and that's actually Joseph Bell, that's not Sherlock Holmes, so it shows you Conan Doyle didn't have that great sense of imagination, we all thought. But if you take Joseph Bell and you mix him again with Hans Gross, it influenced again a person of reality, and this is Dr. Edmund Lacard. Edmund Lacard is one of the founding fathers of forensic science uh, worldwide. He was in Lyon, France, He's responsible for something known as the, the Lockhart exchange principle. Anytime there's contact between two surfaces, there's an exchange of matter, which is the fundamental basis for trace evidence and this idea that, that the evidence can be present even when human witnesses aren't to actually help you solve crimes. So when he got his degree in legal medicine, he approached the Leon Police Department and he went over and said, listen, I've got this great stuff we can start using uh, and I'd love to help you. And they said, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. We kind of don't have any place for you to work, but you know, we'll clear the attic out. You can make your lab up there, you know, your lab thing that you're talking about. And that's what they did. 1911, Leon France, the first police crime laboratory in the world. And the director was Edmund Lacard. And it was a great directorship because he was the only employee. He was the only employee because they had no budget. So they had no budget for anything. So what he had done is he used his expertise in question documents work. And Edmund Lacard actually went looking at wills, looking at documents, and he funded the police laboratory by his own private work. And soon a ragtag bunch of people came to be the first CSI Leon. Now this is, you know, over a hundred years, 110 years ago, right? But they did some amazing stuff. And I just want to take you through two little cases they did because I think it gives you the flavor. So there's a burglary that happened in this jewelry store. And what happened was the burglars broken at night, that's what burglars do. And they went in through the basement. So they went in through a basement door and they, they smashed the door, or forced the door off its hinges, got into a room under where the safe was and tunneled through the floor and actually broke into the safe and pulled its contents out. And the police were stumped because they hadn't seen a crime like this before and they didn't know who did it. So they said, well, let's try out these new people from the lab. Let's see what they can do. So Luckard's team came out and within less than a minute, they're like, it's an inside job. Look for someone who works here. And they're like, well, well you can't say that. And he's like, yeah, I can. Take a look at this little screw from the door hinge. Do you see any wood in the thread from that door hinge? Because if it was pulled out by force, it should look like this. But it wasn't. There was no wood in it. So the door was open when the screws were taken out carefully. And that shows not only it's an inside job, but someone who cared that, you know, they didn't want to damage the door so they could put it all back together at the end. And they solved the case that way. And, and this is the kind of thing that was transformational in the criminal justice system at the time. 
Another case that's also kind of interesting, so there's this main drag and they were having uh, burglaries left and right on the upper floors. Anyone that left their window open was getting burglarized and they couldn't figure it out. There was physical evidence left at these cases. There was fingerprints that were found at the scene, although they didn't look like fingerprints they'd seen before. So thinking outside the box a little bit, what Lockhart did is he said, you know what, you know, back in the day, they had organ grinders all over the place. He's like, let's take a look at these monkeys. And it was more than one organ grinder, which says something right there. So they brought these monkeys in and they discovered a whole bunch of interesting things. First off, that the fingerprints are distinctly different than human, which is uh, very interesting. They are individualistic, which means that each monkey has a different pattern of fingerprints that are there. Uh, they were able to identify which monkey was the culprit. They were able to fingerprint all these monkeys, which also meant that they found out that monkeys don't like being fingerprinted and bite, which is where they came up with this little head thing. But they ended up solving the crime and finding the stuff that came back from it. So these are just kind of two wacky cases that I wanted to point out to you because it really shows the dynacism that they had over a hundred years ago. And to a degree, I'll say that I've been to many jurisdictions as a consultant where I don't even think they could do that now in 2021. So what he was doing was revolutionary and ahead of the curve. But here we're gonna take a turn into literature. If you've heard of T.S. Eliot, you know, he's probably known most famously for uh, Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, you know, which was the basis for the musical, the Broadway musical and a really horrible movie, which I haven't seen, but I heard was really horrible, of cats. And he has a quote that I've always loved and really applies here. And it's from this Thomas Beckett's Murder in a Cathedral where it describes the murder of Archbishop Thomas Beckett under the reign of Henry II. But what it says is, I know that history at all times draws the strangest consequence from remotest cause. So what was the remote cause that, that came up with a strange consequence for Edmund Lacard? What he did was amazing. He was a visionary, a pioneer who created something out of nothing and revolutionized criminal investigation. But unbeknownst to everyone, including himself, he also was making a deal with the devil. And this is what we came back to find. So now we found the divergence in the path. And this is the divergence in the path that took us to a slightly different destination. And this different destination is kind of one of the root causes of a lot of the problems that we have in modern forensic science. So it's time to pony up again. We're good to go. We're going to set us back to our presentation. And off we go. So now what was Lockhart's Faustian bargain? What actually happened in that little clip of history that I showed you that actually caused a lot of the problems that we see now. One of the big things is obviously put the forensic science under law enforcement. Now, this is not a bad thing. Law enforcement serves a really essential function, but it's a very different function than forensic science is. And the other thing that was important to note is that law enforcement at the time was in its infancy. So what ends up happening is imagine you're going on vacation and you have two children, you have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. You're like, you know what? Let me just go with the wife. The five-year-old can watch the three-year-old. That's not very different than where things were at the time. And what that did is it had a problem because it separated science, the forensic science from the scientific community because now it was with law enforcement. So it took it away. And because of that it negatively impacted the ability to have a proper scientific foundation, because instead of being judged by the scientific community, you were judged through law enforcement and its standards. This is huge. There's no dedicated funding source for personnel, equipment, or supplies. And what this did is this created chronic lack of institutional support that every aspect of forensic science still suffers now. The courts are the check and balance on law enforcement. So by default, guess what? The courts are now the check and balance on scientific techniques. So now lawyers and judges necessarily with no scientific background are saying, yes, this technique, which might be total garbage, is valid, or no, this technique, which might be really good, is inadmissible. So it puts us in this kind of wacky position. The other thing is that there's no uniform guidance. And this is true around the world, but just if you look within the United States, what you find is that there is municipal level, um, there is county level, there is state level and there's federal level and there is nobody in charge. It's everyone is kind of doing their own thing and moving at their own pace, which makes it very challenging. So now we saw the bargain. So now what are the challenges? And what do we, once we understand the challenges that helps us address them a little bit better? Well, we talked about ensuring proper validation of existing techniques. You've all heard the expression of trying to fix a car with the engines running and how that's challenging. Well, in this case, it's trying to fix a plane with the engines running, because if you slow that plane down even for a second, it's going to crash. 
And I'm not being dramatic here because if you look at fingerprints that have been out since 1903, 1903 is when they started using them pretty much worldwide. Uh, what do you do? How do you start saying that technique is valid if you don't have the proper scientific foundation? Firearms examinations, same type of thing. 100 years, over 100 years uh, of solid work, but was proper validation done in the beginning to roll these techniques out properly? Uh, footwear comparisons, tire wear comparisons. I can show you illustrations at the wazoo. You know, are all these things, were they properly validated before they roll those out? Looking at blood stains that are found at, at a crime scene, and there's a lot of this is based on physics and it's based on other science, but were proper validations done to show that the techniques are valid? And more importantly, sometimes that the people that are trained appropriately to recognize and use those techniques. And it's not always the old stuff. Some of the new stuff too is also in question. If you look at analytical photogrammetry, which is essentially looking at photographs and trying to determine the height or trying to look at distances from those things. You know, did the appropriate validation occur? And this is a real challenge of how you go about trying to fix this plane while it's running. And while a lot of cases are really depending on this work to go through. The chronic lack of institutional support is just a huge burden and a huge thing that we have to try and overcome. You know, the lack of money for funding and staff, you know, I've been on oversight committees for large police departments and the money was always, well, it's for uniforms on the street first before you're actually looking at this. So a lot of times any, any place there's a partner of a forensic organization and law enforcement organization, the forensic organization is being the back seat. And it can be on the federal level, whether it be the FBI or the ATF, or whether it be the NYPD or the LAPD, you know, agencies that get the funding are going to take care of their law enforcement needs before they take care of their other needs. And the problems for that continue to develop. If you're bored and you want to follow up on this on your own and you're a binger of Netflix, you can see this little uh, mini series they have on how to fix a drug scandal. I will give a little bit of a spoiler alert. They don't tell you how to fix it. And it's really a lot of drama along the way, but it's, it's pretty interesting to see where things go because what it does is it details these two cases that happened in Massachusetts around the same time. So the one on the left here is actually Annie Dukan, and the one on the right is Sonia Farrakh. And both of these things completely went off the rails, but they went off the rails for very different reasons. So Annie Dukan was actually working in a laboratory and she decided she really wanted to impress the people around her, her supervisors and the law enforcement and DAs that she worked with. So she was gonna work at a rate of speed that was astronomical and she did. And she did a great job of doing it because she wasn't burdened by looking at the evidence. She would sign the evidence out, never even open it up and write a report to what was in it and then turn that report in. And the reason she was so astronomically fast is because she wasn't actually doing the work. Sonia Farrakh on the right was a different situation. So she was working at the state police in Amherst as a drug chemist, and she was actually doing the work. The problem is she was high when she was doing the work because she was hopelessly addicted to drugs and working in a drug laboratory, which also becomes problematic. And both of these things are directly related to problems with funding and staff because neither of these places were properly accredited. They didn't have the appropriate staff to monitor these people, to look at these things, if there was an appropriate quality system in place, they clearly would have seen what was going on with Annie Dukan. Uh, they wouldn't have allowed Sonia Farrakh to be in the laboratory alone and walking over to the fume hood and actually taking the analytical standards and, and physically drinking them in the laboratory. It's just a crazy situation, but really, you don't have to go very far to see it's a funding and staff problem. Hey, Brian. How did it, go ahead. I'm going to jump in here because we do have a, a question in the chat box, and I think it's just going to might back you up a couple of slides. I'm not sure exactly sure. which one, but the question is, um, is the concern with validation, the ripple effect for cases built around these techniques? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and if you look at all these techniques that I'm showing you here, it's not that I don't believe that they're, not, they're invalid, that they're not valid. But the thing is you have to have proper validation to show. Mm. And one of the things we're seeing with all of these things, and one of the things I was really pushing before I left running the accreditation program within New York, is moving how we report results. So instead of saying that this fingerprint or this footprint is from Dean Smith, what I would say is give a probabilistic result. So come up with some statistical basis to give it back. Because the thing is, can you always, and again, we might be getting into the weeds here, but we have the time and I always love talking about this stuff. <laughs> but the thing is, can you, can you actually show absolute attribution? What are you trying to do to, to really paint a picture that the jury can understand 
And being a true and a good forensic scientist is making sure you represent things accurately and correctly, not necessarily in the bias of toward law enforcement, because the evidence is what it is. We have no bias in, we shouldn't have a bias. It should be a situation of the evidence will speak to what it can say to. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Sure thing. So we just passed them. So funding for instrumentation. So because there is no standard funding line that's coming out for these types of things, what ends up happening is everyone has to kind of do their own thing to get by. And that means even accreditation that exists right now for forensic science leaves a lot of flexibility in the analytical ways you can achieve your goal. Now, all about having flexibility, but the concern with that is that everyone has a different way of doing it. And one way is way more sensitive than the other. You actually can have method standardization, which means you can actually have variability between laboratories. And that's a reality now that two laboratories that might even serve overlapping jurisdictions, you might have a municipal or a county laboratory that all, you know, obviously you've got a town within a county within a state. So theoretically the evidence could go to any one of those three. And if it went to any one of those three, it could come back with a different result. This is something that's come from this lack of institutional support the courts are the checks and balances. Now, this is going to be something that's really uh, for the non-initiated and even some within the field is kind of a wacky thing. So the way it works is if I develop a technique right now, let's say um, Dean's holding a picture and he's holding some picture of something of evidence, you know, whether it be child pornography or a murder scene or something like that. And I say, well, I want to look at the picture and not look at the fingerprint from his hand, but I want to look at it, the digit on his hand. And I will say, I can identify this as Dean's finger above anybody else's. Okay, I'll make this claim. So what happens is I will say that, the police will arrest the person, they'll go to trial, and at trial, on the back end, the judge will then decide what I did is if it's scientifically admissible. Now, if it went on the state level, there's one level, depending on which state you're in, and it varies from state to state, and there's legal standards of Fry and Daubert uh, that, are, that are out there. But if it goes on the federal level, it's a completely different standard. So it, it's kind of a wacky process that's on the back end. So let me give you an example in a world that you might understand. Everyone now is looking to retire. So you, you've made enough money, you're gonna go build a house in North Carolina on the beach. So you come over and you decide, we well, you know what, I'm gonna build a house here. And you buy some land from someone, but you don't have it surveyed. So you don't know where the borders are. Uh, you then go to try to build the house and you go ahead and you come up with plans yourself, but you don't have anyone look at them to see if they're to code or anything like that. So you go and you build the house. And then when the house is built and sitting on this property, you then go find an inspector. And that inspector, by the way, knows nothing about building, knows nothing about property lines, knows nothing about that. And that, that inspector could be both on the state level or the federal level. So they could have a totally different standard for the same exact house. And then you say, is this good? Does this work? It sounds kind of ass backwards, doesn't it? It's not necessarily the way this should work. So one of the things we see is that the courts and the science don't always kind of juxtaposition well. Giving you some other quick examples of that. So the way court works is it's not necessarily one trial that goes to fruition. Judges will have multiple dockets that are running simultaneously. So in one case that Judge Weyer had in New York City, uh, a defense attorney made a motion saying, listen, the DNA evidence on this case, there's two different types of DNA evidence, and I think it's inadmissible. So he made this long legal motion, the judge considers the motion, and then once they decide the motion, then they move ahead with that trial. So they're hearing other cases when that's happening. So in this particular case, the judge received a motion, he's considering about this DNA evidence, if it's valid or not, and he makes his decision. So he calls the attorneys for that case back to his court pauses the case that he has going on right now, which is completely unrelated. So the members of that case go sit in the benches and then the people that hear the motion come sit at the tables in the front. And he says, listen, I've made my decision. The DNA, this type of DNA is inadmissible in my court. And at that time, the people in the back jump up and say, well, wait a second, your honor, that's the exact same DNA that's being used in our cases. They go, oh, no, it's okay there. That one's okay, but this one is not. What? <laughs> you know, this type of thing happens all the time. And again, it's because there's not necessarily a scientific basis, which would say if it's not valid in one, it's not valid in the other. And I'm not trying to defend the particular DNA taste type of evidence that was thrown out, but it just doesn't make logical sense that the same judge with the same courtroom would admit on one case and not admit on the other. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, going to the Sonia Farak case, you know, Judge Kinder. So she worked at the laboratory since 2004. She's arrested in 2013. 
And when she's arrested, she's arrested because they fi can't find a piece of evidence. They start looking for it. They look in her draw, find the evidence open, find crack pipes in her draw. And when they go to court, because she was testifying on another case, she was under the influence. So that's usually a pretty good sign that you might be onto something here. And in my business, they call that a clue. So regardless, the defense attorneys came forward and they said, listen, we have concerns about the work she did, which is valid. If you have an analyst that's completely intoxicated and intoxicated with the evidence at the time, that calls into question some of the work they did. And the judge says, well, we can look back to July of 2012, but no further. Well, later when it was determined, she had actually been completely stoned out of her gourd since 2004. And actually, before she even started working in the laboratory where this happened, and if they would have even done something simple as drug testing before she started, she wouldn't have been working there. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the legal decisions don't always make sense, and they're not always based on the evidence, and they're not always based on the root cause, and they're not necessarily a corrective action in any way, shape, or form. So this, this marriage between the courts and forensic science is clearly an uneasy one. This lack of uniform guidance. So... I just want to give you a contemporary example, and I'm sure this is happening in every industry, but I'm going to complain about forensic science because that's just what you gave me 45 minutes to do this morning. So they, they started what's called the Laboratory Information Management System or a LIM system. And this started probably in, you know, I would say 10, 15 years ago, where all the laboratories around the country were migrating from pen, paper, pencil, photographs to trying to move to digital systems to try and have everything where evidence would be accessioned into the laboratory through an electronic means, reports would be uh, generated that way, and they would track evidence that way. And that's like medical records. You can look in any industry. These things are not unique to forensic science. So what happens is they set these whole processes up, but the people that are the LIMS vendors, who do they go to to define the terms? They go to the laboratory. So each laboratory is setting their terms up completely differently. What that means is that the digital outputs from these laboratories do not translate between labs. It's the Tower of Babel because there is no uniform guidance. No one said, listen, this is what a piece of evidence is and this is how you handle this and this is where this goes. So it has real-time consequences when you're trying to look at things like backlog management or apply any management principles or track things through the labs that all of these things are independent. And all of these problems are stemming from the things that we talked about, our little, our little trip in history. Uh, more contemporary uh, thing is report standardization. So when I entered the, the scene in, as, as an executive within New York State government, looking at the accreditation program, I saw that how forensic laboratories, and even sometimes the same forensic laboratory, reported results was vastly different. And it was just a wacky thing. So we had something called the Report Standardization Initiative. So I, I partnered with the New York Crime Laboratory uh, Advisory Committee, which was the crime laboratory directors. And I had all these things called technical working groups. They're things that I sponsored. So we basically paid for people to come together from the different disciplines. So over here, you can see biology, crime scene, digital evidence, drugs, fire, firearms, latent prints, question documents, toxicology, trace evidence, all the different things that were done within the state of New York within the 18 at the time forensic labs. Now I believe there's up to 22 that are there. And what we said is we want to come up with guidelines that everyone can issue reports on. And this wasn't earth shattering, but it was a first step. Every journey starts with a little step. So we said, identify standard components that must be present in a report, develop standardized reporting language. And this is really important. If there's a qualifier or disclaimer, you have to identify the time it would come in and also standardize what that qualifier or disclaimer is, and also have standardized definitions, right? Pretty straightforward. This was herding cats. This took forever to put together. But you know what? I'm kind of proud to say that I stood this up uh, back in 2013, and it's still to this day uh, the only in the world, actually the only in the galaxy, um, report standardization, which is really ridiculous. You know, you would think that you'd want these things to be the same, and some of the things, like if you have the term consistent with, okay, this particular evidence was consistent with that. Well, what does that even mean? Well, in one laboratory, it meant, well, I can't rule it out. In another laboratory, it was just under an inclusion. That's a vast chasm to be try and have defined in that one term. So, so in each of these disciplines, it was a real treat to try and have these conversations. But eventually, you know, we, we kind of got people on board, but it just kind of shows that 
you know, nationwide, uh, the states can take initiatives, but they only go so far. And I'm not with New York State anymore, and I'm not sure necessarily how long they'll even comply with this anymore. It might just go the way of the wind. I'm not sure. But, you know, it's, it's the first little step, and you're not seeing that, that federal initiative to take things like this that make sense and move forward with them. But there have been, you know, we've kind of been uh, doing a little schadenfreude up to now, but now I want to start talking about some positive things. There have been pockets of regulation that have really made a difference. What do I mean by a pocket of regulation? Well, the first thing was the DNA data bank. In 1998, there was the national level of the combined DNA index system was implemented and the FBI was doing it. So they basically said, we're gonna keep this computer database of all DNA profiles from crime scenes and you can submit them if, you can be part of it if you are accredited and if you follow our quality assurance standards for forensic DNA testing. Huge positive change. It was a huge positive change because now there was an increased focus on quality assurance that wasn't there before, which is a significant component of accreditation. And it started because ISO 17025, the international standard in 2005 for forensic science started saying, well, we need to start focusing on root cause and corrective action. And both of these things, and I think they just started with root cause and I think they evolved into corrective action. I don't know the history exactly on that. So there's other attempts to provide guidance there was a National Commission on Forensic Science that came out for a little bit. There was 37 members between 2014 and 2017. And it, it didn't work as effectively as one would like. You know, there was, you know, they had to, everyone had to be, all the communities had to be engaged with it. So you met, you had a lot of fighting people that were fighting each other as opposed to moving forward. Their mandate was not necessarily as narrow as it should have been. So they started looking at death investigation and forensic laboratories. And as many problems as I've described to you now with forensic laboratories, uh, it is eons ahead of death investigation in this country where death investigation is still the wild west. And because they were so different in what they were trying to achieve, they really didn't achieve as much as they probably should have before they just uh, kind of faded into the wind. Uh, there's something called the Organization of Scientific Area Committees or the OSAC, which is run out of the National Institute of Science and Technology. And the OSAC is a good idea. So what they did is they, they took all the different disciplines and they kind of broke them down and they made little groups and said, you know what, we're gonna start looking at standards. And they went through the process of developing standard boards and people that can disseminate standards. And you know, it's a work in progress and it's a good start. But this whole idea as, as decent as the town has some severe limitations to it. And mainly it's still trying to accommodate for the lack of institutional support. So because of that, these standards are a little bit too loosey goosey for me. So if you kind of look, there's a case from 1989, this, this girl is abducted, raped and murdered. And then they solve the case now, almost 33 years later with the smallest amount of DNA ever, which sounds great, right? 15 cells of DNA solved this case. And it turned out the person was already deceased, but they found them from a DNA data bank and some genetic genealogy. But the problem I have with this is that the OSACs are not setting a minimum standard. So people can do kind of whatever they want. So the detection limits should be something in my opinion that's set at a standard that everyone is complying with. And when you have one laboratory, in this case, private laboratory, that's kind of way off the charts it, it kind of gets wacky. So there needs to be governors on either side of this to make sure what we do and what we go forward with is valid and, and, and makes sense. Uh, taking an analogy that's not necessarily forensic related, it's actually not forensic at all. You know, if you're a football fan, you've heard the name Pop Warner. If you're not a football fan, you've seen a Pop Warner football field probably in your town or wherever you are. Uh, Pop Warner was a football coach and the area I'm going to focus on where he did was when he was with the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Okay, so he took this ragtag bunch of kids who really had guts and brawn but didn't have the history of working with football, didn't have the resources, and he was in the fray and he was doing an amazing job. And in 1903, he was going against one of their chief rivals, which was the Harvard Crimson Tide, who clearly institutional support was not one of their problems. And he said, listen, we're gonna get our, our head snookered here. So we gotta do something different. So Pop Warner came up with something known as the hidden ball. Now football was a different game back in 1900. There was not a passing game. I know that's hard to believe, but what they did is it was a kick return. You caught the ball, you ran down the field and hilarity ensued as people without masks and helmets and padding you know, bombarded each other. 
So what the hidden ball was that Pop Warner did is he changed the uniforms of the people from Carlisle Indian School, so they all had secret compartments. And what happened is when they received the kick return, they went into a little bit of a semicircle, kind of blocking, and they would hide who had the ball. And then one person would mimic having the ball, Crimson Tides would plow on top of him, and then the cheer from the crowd would be when the other guy who had the ball would run down the field, pull it out of the secret compartment, and pull a tick return touchdown. So what's what's the comparison here to what we're talking about? I don't want us to make rules this way. In forensic science, we should not be pushing the envelope. Within um, the field of football, Pop Warner, if you're actually curious and a football fan, he almost every rule of contemporary football was made by Pop Warner pushing it. He would do something and say, well, there wasn't a rule for it, even to the point of someone running out of bounds and running down the field. Well, there's not a rule for it. It's okay. That's not the way science has to develop. What we need to do is we need to have governors. We need to be working with validated techniques for us to be taken seriously and for problems not to come down the line. So one other attempt at, at providing guidance that I think is an interesting initiative, I'm not sure where it's going to go just yet, is grant funding for academic curriculums. So when they started pushing out this whole thing with the OSACs with the standard development, I think they realized, do kids even know what a standard is and what to do with it? So the federal government has put out these initiatives for any program, not necessarily a forensic program, to change their curriculum to make students aware of and be able to use standards better. And I think that's not necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, just to, to make sure I kind of issue all the places where I see guidance being in, being put out there, I wanted to make sure I included this. And I also think it's a really neat idea. So now we're kind of standing on the precipice. So I brought you up to speed. I think everyone in this last 30 something minutes has seen what our problems are, what we're facing, and you understand how we got there. So now the question is, where do we go? And we could keep on the same path. You know, obviously you can keep going down that same road. I don't think it's going to end well. I can't see if you keep doing the same thing, how you're going to end up with a different result. What I recommend is that we actually take a different path. And that path is going to have its highs, it's going to have its lows. But I think ultimately, after a little bit of time and a little bit of trouble, we're going to get to a better place and a place we need to be. And if nothing else, you need to look back again at Edmund Lacard, who I see as one of the founding fathers of forensic science. You know, he's a visionary, created something out of nothing, uh, just revolutionized modern criminal investigations. It's not fair for us to take things that went wrong after he gave us a really a gift that really changed the world. So maybe I should put him into my front slide. He gave us a gift that changed the world, but it's being outweighed by the problems of how we work with it. So what do we do? So this is the part where we start moving forward and we develop a plan, right? Well, in order to do something, let's be realistic. The only person talking about this right now is me. Nobody else is talking about this. So we have to be realistic about what we're going to do. And I'm going to try and, and, and become a vocal advocate for change and publish and present just like I'm doing now. But we have to be realistic that we have to set our goals at manageable levels. So essentially, we have to pick the low-hanging fruit. We have to do stuff that will be the least possible change to give you the most possible result. So what's worked so far? What have we done that's worked so far? Well, obviously, restricting access to the DNA database, I think, has worked swimmingly. So that's something we want to do. And we've seen and it's been demonstrated that guidance must come from the federal level. The problem is they stink at providing guidance. They're really not good at it. And let me pick another industry. I'm an aviation buff. Uh, you can kind of see this if you've ever seen my office, a little planes and stuff everywhere. So let's look at a helicopter crash that occurred in 2018 in New York City. So there was this passenger um, aircraft. It was a helicopter, an Airbus helicopter, and they had the doors removed and there were special harnesses on the passenger so they could actually photograph and experience the wind while flying over New York City, which was a neat thing. So this is the last photo the person in the front took before his foot or a bag accidentally hit the fuel off switch on the floor, the little toggle, causing the Airbus helicopter to then auto-rotate into the East River. The pilot was taken by surprise with this. They didn't have sufficient altitude, so he didn't have chance to inflate the airbags in time, and the helicopter turned over. Because of these harnesses that people were wearing, the pilot was able to get away by cutting them off, but all five passengers died. This happened in March 13th of 2018. In March 13th of 2018, they had a strong suspicion that what happened was this little toggle switch that was right by the foot of this one front seat passenger that was in the off position was the reason. So fast forward now two years, 
and they issue a report saying, guess what? This toggle switch is probably the reason. Fast forward now to this month, this month, 41 months after it happened. And what does the FAA say? What is their, what is their response to something that took five lives and is very simple to fix? Well, we recommend that you put a little plate over the switch so people can't flip it. So these are the people we want, we want to be giving us guidance. You know, not to quote Seinfeld too much here, but you want to be my latex salesman? This just seems kind of crazy. But, but you have to do it. Do they have the authority to do anything? I believe they do. And I think you know that they do because they give everybody money. The federal government gives money to every level of government. And we've seen that work because from 1974 to 1995, the Emergency Highway Energy Conservation Act changed the national speed limit to 55. Okay, and even now, if you're under 21, you're not getting a drink in this country. Why is that? Because if you do, and if a state changes the law, they will lose all federal funding. There is the hammer. We have the hammer. Now, the question is, what nails should we use to try and fix this problem? And how do we motivate people to do that? Well, mandatory laboratory accreditation, I think, is the low-hanging fruit. And you might be surprised to know that there's still a lot of forensic laboratories out there that are not accredited. And when I say mandatory, I mean mandatory, which means no loopholes. So the National uh, Commission on Forensic Science, they actually tried an initiative and they, they put a little recommendation out while they were still standing. And the attorney general then forward and said, listen, you know, all federal laboratories except blah, 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 which meant loophole, 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 loophole. We need to be all. It needs to be all government laboratories that perform forensic work at any level of government need to be accredited. Now, accreditation is not a panacea. Just recently, the Consolidated Forensic Lab in D.C. lost their accreditation due to a problem they had. That's the first time in history a forensic lab had its accreditation pulled. So forensic labs are going to have problems. But, and there's a big but here, they have a standard to meet if they have accreditation and they have some level of oversight. So they have something that they have to have you can take away. And more important than any of that, they have a quality system, which you can hear me say it, incorporates root cause and corrective action. So this is the problem though. We, and I mean forensic scientists, not you guys, you guys love doing this stuff, but forensic scientists are bad at failure analysis. And why is that? Well, there's no uniform path to becoming a forensic scientist. So people can have a forensic science degree. They can have a traditional science degree. I have a combination of the two. I have an undergraduate in traditional science and graduate in forensic science. Uh, there's people with non-science degrees. One of the most significant persons that was doing um, firearms examinations had a degree in church ministries, which seems kind of crazy, but he was a really good firearms examiner, but that's what his degree was in. And there's a lot of people that have no degree at all. So you'll see this because there's a lot of law enforcement impact still within latent print community and firearms community. And some of those people have no degree at all. So if we look at not just the, the, the career path educationally that they came in there, but look at external training courses, uh, some have on the job training, some have no training at all. It just, it, it's kind of crazy. Sorry, I shot by there. So some have some external training, some have uh, training on the job. And I'd say a majority have no training at all in, in root cause analysis or failure analysis or understanding the significance of learning from where we make mistakes. So why is failure analysis so important? And here I'm clearly preaching to the choir. You know, in my mind, the thing that separates humans from every other species is our ability not to just to learn from ourselves, but to learn from the collective wisdom of those who came before us and come alongside us. Now, the problem is when you don't do that, every day is Groundhog Day. Every day you're repeating the same thing and not understanding how you got there and why you got there. So what I tried to do when I came to New York State is I tried to look at failure analysis in other industries, and I tried to look at what I called um, high-profile failures. So when things go wrong in forensic science, they make the paper. So is there anything bigger than that? Well, I think you guys all know there is, but I was kind of looking in this line, being an aviation enthusiast. You know, when things go off the rails and everyone wants to know about it. And I started looking at the National Transportation Safety Board's investigation protocols, and that kind of led me to this little guy who I see on the, on the line. He's got his camera off, but if you want to look, that's a kinder and gentler version of Bob Nelms. Um, and we had a lot of discussions. And what we did is I actually brought him to New York State and we did a bunch of training in his latent cause analysis process for the examiners in the state of New York. And I, I, I am personally think it's transformational. I think he's got a great idea, a great concept. Uh, he encouraged me to go look at other programs as well. 
but within my agency and my office, I created uh, protocols that really followed his thing. And, and we did training and I offered that training to people at the FBI that came and attended. You know, one of the trainings that we actually did happen during one of the biggest blizzards in New York state history. And believe it or not, and Bob can confirm this, we actually still had a class because people were coming in from all over the state. They were in their hotels anyway. So I found ways to get them there. And we, even in the biggest blizzard where the entire state was shutting down, we had a class. And I think there was a lot of support once people started drinking the Kool-Aid. But the problem is the bosses still weren't drinking the Kool-Aid. And there was a couple of times when QA managers, quality assurance managers would, would be part of this, but there's a lot of times when they weren't and laboratory directors definitely were not engaged in this process and it was a real problem. So as we start looking to come up with a solution, I think what we need to also do is change the forensic accreditation guidelines. And that first one is that the laboratory directors have to have training in root cause analysis. Now, yes, you're the overall manager, but I think if you don't understand the significance of this stuff, I, th I think it's hard to really make educated decisions. I think we need to require all lab staff to actually have exposure, maybe not a full root cause class, but at least to have something to expose them uh, to, to what the merits of this type of thing are. Um, and just like we saw what the, NTA, the NIST was doing, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, with trying to grant fund some standard programs uh, for a curriculum, I think we need to do that in forensic science academic programs. There is an accreditation for forensic science academic programs. It's not mandatory, but I think people that do participate in that accreditation program need to also incorporate root cause and corrective action into the training that they're teaching the next group of people that will come into these laboratories. Because I think what you're going to find is that when someone comes out of an academic program and comes into a laboratory, they're going to probably know more than the people that are in that laboratory. And that's pretty scary. Now, I'll take it one more and say we should grant and incentivize this for all higher education programs. You know, we saw that with the NIST thing. It wasn't limited to forensic science programs. And I'm not sure I see a downside in higher education really looking at this whole thing, no matter what your major is. Um, maybe I'm taking it too far there, but you see I've clearly drunk from the Kool-Aid. So here, as I start kind of wrapping it up, I just want to show you a little career path of what we're going to try and do here, or what I'm going to try and do here, is right now, I think we need to start dramatically increasing the exposure of root cause training to forensic scientists and, and mandating to people within the accreditation programs there that, that administrators within those laboratories are trained in that type of procedure. I think within five years, we need to mandate loophole-free forensic accreditation. So not, well, you know, you're busy, so we're not going to make you do it because you're a digital lab or you're a latent print lab. No, nope. if you do the work, you have to be accredited. You have to do this. Mandate crime scene accreditation. So I haven't talked about crime scene yet. Crime scene is different than the forensic laboratory, but I think you can get there a little further out. And if people see a path, I think eight years down the line, they should have the same level of accreditation. And I've already given some presentations at national meetings and international meetings about the need for crime scene to be accredited uh, and, and for people to start having some level of quality system involved in the work that they do. Because if you don't recover this evidence right from the beginning, you have some real problems. You have some real problems because there's nothing a laboratory can do, no matter how sophisticated, if the evidence was never properly documented or collected. I think a little further down the line, I think we should look at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, taking a more centralized forensic oversight role, because I think it needs to be there. There needs to be that uniform guidance, and I put it down as 10 years. And then this last little stop on my, on my path is creating a safe space within forensic science to discuss future failures. And I put within 15 years, but maybe we can move that down, and maybe that can happen simultaneously while some of these other things are happening because there's a lot of siloing. So even if there is a good process for root cause and corrective action, it's within a single laboratory and there's no way for that information to be disseminated to other laboratories, condemning them, the sins of our father, to, cre to create the same problem all over again. So this is just a crude roadmap of, of where I'm gonna try and take this. Uh, I'm definitely at this point interested in, in any feedback that you guys have if I'm barking up the wrong tree. Um, but because this is the time I'm going to say, if you have any questions or any time for discussion, uh, this is where I'd love to hear it. And thanks for taking this morning uh, to sit and talk with me. Brian, thanks. That was a uh, enlightening story and you're a good storyteller. So I really appreciate the, the background and the history. And I've, I'm going to just reiterate what you just asked everybody. You know, first off, if anybody has any questions or comments, please just unmute yourself or raise your hand or chat it into the chat box. And then 
to build on that. Um, any feedback for Brian about about anything, but about the path he just sort of um, charted out and, and comments on that. And looks like Tanya, your hand is up. Tanya, what do you think? I've got a little notepad out, so I'm looking for it. <laughs> there you go. So Tanya. thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. Like extraordinarily enlightening. Um, one aspect that I thought you might have covered, but um, I'm sure has an influence on this is the popularization of programs like, you know, CSI and, and things like this. It's become part of pop culture, forensic science. And I'm just wondering, you had talked about chronic institutional support being lacking. Would this popularization of, of the field maybe push more attention to getting this to be recognized as something that is, you know, worthy of funding? It's a, it's a great question. And the answer is absolutely not. And just looking at my career, I've also was a television consultant. So I was a consultant for Law and Order and some other shows for NBC. And when I was an academic, we actually um, partnered with CSI at one point. And essentially what these shows want to do is they want to come in and say everything's great. And there's no problems, but they don't want to give anything to it. And, you know, obviously it's, those shows have changed how jury's impressions are. I just recently, for the first time in my life, and it's kind of wacky, served on a jury. I was on grand jury. And it's just amazing what some of my colleagues, you know, you have a little crazy crime and they're asking for body cam footage and they're asking for, did you do DNA on this? And I'm like, really? They're they can barely do DNA on homicide cases now because of crime lab backlogs and you're asking about a petty theft. But uh, it's a very good point you raise is shouldn't there be more funding because of the increased awareness, but it's sort of like everyone wants the attention from it, but they don't want to do anything to fix it. And part of that problem is because it's not an easy problem to fix. You know, this is going to take some political will. It's going to take some money. You know, when I talk about this idea of mandatory accreditation, that sounds like something that's easy, but I'm not even sure there's sufficient accreditation providers right now to be up to speed for all the people that would be mandatorily accredited. So I'm hoping at this point, since the National Commission made this recommendation already, that they've been starting to ramp up. There's definitely more providers out there. And to comply with the international standards takes time. They have to be accredited in order to do it. But, you know, it's a process and it's going to be an ugly process. I showed you that roads got some hills and valleys along the way, you know, but we, I think we have to go down it because they haven't up to now. And I absolutely love the field I'm in. You know, it, it's definitely something where um, I'm going to do it till the day I die, no matter what. But I, I'm very concerned. And I think to a degree, I've got a unique perspective because I've been in the field. I went to academia. I got recruited back to the field, then kind of moving from there to being a consultant it's, it's allowed me some perspectives. And I think even when I was an executive with the NYPD, which was one of the, the labs that I managed, I didn't realize and appreciate as much the value of root cause until I started managing the accreditation program for New York State and started seeing all the problems from the different laboratories and kind of, that it was kind of wacky how it was being approached. So it's a good question. Unfortunately, the answer for it, I can definitively say it's not gonna help. Let's see if we have. So another question is: there, Is there a viable standard for the con? Is there a viable standard for conducting um, root cause analysis, and is one needed? Uh, well, I love Bob Nelms. You know, me and Normal we get along <laughs> real well. Uh, so I personally think the latent cause process is a great one. I got to tell you, I experienced a lot of pushback from both my agency and from the different laboratories based on the blame-free component of that. Because as you've seen, when we were talking about it at the annual meeting, uh, they want to blame people. They want to make it easy. They want to make it go away. And doing it blame-free is challenging. And it's not one they want to accept. And also they're looking to charge people. So let's take the Sonia Farak case. You know, she was in a situation where uh, she was intoxicated with controlled substances at her own lab. They say, well, you can't make that blame free. And Annie Dukan did jail time, as did Sonia Farak. So they, they, they went to jail. So in those situations, it's going to be a hard, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's going to be a hard sell for my industry to sell a blame free thing. Although I, I tried adamantly to do that. And I saw Bob waving his little hand. I don't know if he couldn't unmute himself or he's just saying hi or you know, sitting out on the mountains. But feel no, free to I chime do. in if you want, Bob. There we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 
Brian, you, you kind of addressed it right there, but uh, th this is it's related to what we're talking about right now. I remember during the Albany class, during that uh, that blizzard, there was a girl who really made an impression on me uh, because she was distraught for the whole class, very distraught. And she was just indicative of how many people felt going through the class. And I think when I talked to her, what she was so distraught about was she said she can't look at herself as part of any problem that pops up. She cannot do that because if she admits fault, if she admits that she actually did something wrong, not only will she not work at that lab, she'll never work at any other lab. And she's got kids that she's got to feed. Uh, so and that's, an absolute, a, that's a very valid point, unfortunately. And part of it is because of you know, the state inspector general's office within New York State has authority over all the forensic laboratories, and they have a long history of destroying people for no reason. And the Nassau County lab failure, uh, the failures in that laboratory were attributed to a narrow subset of people. There were some people in that lab that were doing excellent work. Their careers were ruined forever based on that report. In Monroe County, there was a, a, a trainee who was during her training made a mistake, not a big deal, a trainee was caught, et cetera. She was never allowed to work again in New York state and had to move to a whole nother state. So how the overall infrastructure works is screwed up, but that's also why we can't trust states to do this. This is why it has to come from the feds. They have to put on their big girl, big boy pants and actually take over doing these types of things. And this is a long process and I'm not under any illusion that Many of these things will not even be changed when I'm pushing up daisies. But, you know, we can either walk away from it and say there's no problem or it's not my problem. But I, I care enough about this field where I feel like I need, needs to be the squeaky wheel. And maybe somewhere down the line, someone will say, you know, maybe that's not such a bad idea. Or even if they take credit for it, I don't care who takes credit for it. But we've just got to move ourselves to a better place. And I'm glad you remember that because that's scary, isn't it? Isn't that scary? Yeah. Keep the faith and keep pushing, Brian. <laughs> yeah. We have a couple more uh, questions in chat. Um, so the first one is, is there a forensic professionals community of practice? Well, that's an interesting question. So there are professional organizations. There's the American Academy of Forensic Science. There's direct, the lab directors have one. But as far as a code of practice, no. No, there's not. And there's a lot of wacky things that happen within it. And, and, and I've got to tell you right now, it really pains me to look to the federal government for oversight at anything because they're so bad at it. But I, I would love for someone to tell me a different path because I just can't think of one. I, I think it kind of has to go there. And I think also when you look up the objective evidence and, and it took forever, P.S., it took forever for it to happen. But, you know, right now, I think I've got to kind of charge at that windmill. I've got to say that this is where we're going to head, you know? And there's one more from, so Tanya, can you just unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask your question if you would, please. Oh, I have a couple more, but. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so maybe this is just my impression, but you had talked about the COVID crisis to, to start this whole subject. Mm -hmm. And I get the impression that people for the first time are seeing what science looks like you know, how publications drive science and the scientists are not necessarily all on the same page in interpreting the evidence. And, um, but at the end of the day, people are, I th think, looking more to public health experts than judges for the definitive answer on what we should be doing with the state of the evidence, right, you know, as, as we stand. I'm just wondering if this experience could help inform a way forward for uh, forensics to decouple their relationship with the courts. I don't think, and I thank you for that comment, and I think it's a good one, but I don't think we will ever decouple. Like my lofty goal and ambition is to actually have the National Institute of Standards and Technology have a division, and that division looks at and approves forensic techniques that are good for use. The courts can still do whatever they want. You're never going to take power away from a lawyer. It'll never happen. You know, it's just not going to happen. It's never going to happen in my lifetime. It's never going to happen in the collective lifetimes of anyone here. So I think instead of fighting that battle, what I'd like to do is say, 
to help you make your decision, have scientists look at it. Right. Now, the problem is science overall is so politicized. You know, I can pick a numerous things, whether it be masks and COVID or global warming or whatever. So I think you can find people that are going to scream back and forth and say, scientists say all these things. But I think if we can just find what's acceptable, you know, it might be that what's acceptable is not as good as I would like. But you know what? If it's acceptable and it's approved, we can move forward with it. Because I think when you start being a little bit of a cowboy, and don't get me wrong, I was, in my career I was, I was trying to push the envelope because I was trying to look at it. But uh, I think you need, to, you need to pull it in because you need to look at the future and you need to look at um, the whole process overall. So for you to have confidence in the whole process, there needs to be more continuity and consistency among the product that you get out of these different laboratories if that makes any sense. And again, a lot of this is my opinion and feel free to understand and disagree with it. So the, the last, uh, well, two, two minor things. Um, one is um, you need to find yourself a tribe. You had said in your talk that you're the only guy talking about this. I, I suspect you might have more allies than enemies. So start collecting your allies as opposed to uh, being the lone wolf kind of thing. That's but, but it'd be one. interesting because kind of, if you notice, that's why I'm talking to this group because I'm talking to a group that doesn't have uh, skin in the game. Someone right. can look objectively from the outside. And if anyone is ever interested in being a co-author or a co-presenter, even if I do the lion's share of the work, love to have you. Because essentially I'm looking for people to become the army of the good on this. And it's going to be hard within the field. And, you know, when I was an executive within the NYPD lab, I was a civilian and I was an assistant director of, of one of the largest and busiest crime laboratories in the country, but it's still a police laboratory and everything I said was vetted. When I worked for New York State, it was vetted 37 ways from Sunday. You know, I'm now at a place where I can talk. People within the field, even if they agree with me, they're a, lo a lot of them are not in a place that they can talk. Very, very, very few, as a matter of fact, are. So I'm actually trying as best I can to look outside of the field to this and even if you have suggestions for other agencies and other approaches because i can't believe i'm this is the only um field that's had this problem so anywhere i can find help and guidance from outside and maybe even better solutions i, I am not opposed to stealing solutions from someone else and then crediting them you know that that's what we do in academia all the time right you know we um, steal stuff talking, from other people and we credit them <laughs> so talking about academia you your first slide had todd conklin on it he's one of the guys who is pushing safety to realize perhaps the road that you're suggesting has already been traversed by the safety community Love and they're yeah. starting to realize that it has gotten them to a place of malicious compliance <laughs> and a place where um, a lot of people, criminalization of normal work and this kind of stuff. Sure. So um, there's a manifesto for um, safety, you know, safety science in that I put into the chat, one of uh, Drew Ray's, he's another uh, mover shaker in this field, um, that I would recommend that you look at because um, Eric Hallnagel, another guy, has said that while you're absolutely right, the world responds to an aviation accident, a plane crashes, everybody's interested, but very few people are interested in the success of, of all the planes that successfully land. And there's tons of evidence that we're ignoring when we don't look at normal work and how uh, you know, uh, complex it is, and that we don't need to wait for a disaster or needing to do a root cause to be able to start looking at things with the same mindset. Yeah, I agree. And um, again, Bob, Bob's not getting any financial compensation from this presentation, by the way. But when, when, when I set up the root cause process within my agency within the state of New York, we didn't just look at the big stuff, we looked at everything because the little stuff got you to the big stuff. So if you fix the little stuff, then uh, the big stuff didn't happen. And I think one of the things that I, I like to think is the biggest legacy is that it really, Bob's process with the latent cause analysis wasn't top driven, it was bottom driven. And because it was bottom driven, it empowered people to feel like they had a voice. And I know I've seen this in other presentations that happened that the more you empower the person who's actually doing the work. We saw this at the annual meeting when they were talking about, you know, safety in relation to log cutting. When we empower the people that are doing the work, then they actually care. And you know what? They're an army for good. 
So that's what I was trying to create within New York State. But as I said, the problem was there was so much pressure from the top. There was so much objective evidence that if you do the right thing, you're going to get jammed up for it, that I couldn't get the buy-in that I needed. So I, I, you know, this might, some of these things might be bigger. So if you look at my, my goals on the bottom level of trying to increase root cause training and then mandating accreditation, both for the labs and then crime scene, you know, those are low hanging fruit things. Cause I think they will, they will improve quality regardless of what happens, even if it's not through root cause and corrective action. Although to me, I think that's going to be the pathway to improvement. Those things alone will improve quality. Okay, we have one last question and then we're gonna to have to wrap it up. And we, the question is, did the effort with the state of New York identify forensic best practices? Uh, well, there was many efforts within the state of New York and we tried, I tried to develop and promulgate best practices. Um, the agency didn't wanna do that. You know, even though we were in a, in a position that really could have taken a leadership position, you know, the way politicians run agencies is they put their hand in the wind which way is the wind going? And the, the things that I heard all the time are, we don't want to get out in front of that. And, you know, I'm not sure what the optics are and, you know, insert your catchphrase. So I clearly thought we had a role in creating best practices and I thought we had a duty to do so. Uh, the people above me did not allow me to take that route. So it's a great question. And just before we go, I do want to thank everybody for taking, you know, what should be your vacation and some like Dean who are on vacation to, to join me for this. And, you know, since it is recorded, you know, if someone wasn't able to get there and you think anyone is can benefit from this or more importantly, help me, please forward it to them and, and let them look. And if they like it, I'd love to talk to people. And as I said, my contact information is there, you know, reach out whenever you can. And thanks and have a great summer. Brian, thank you very much. And everybody, I echo what Brian just said. Thanks for taking the time and offering the feedback. And yeah, take a, we'll pause here for just a moment. Make sure everybody's written down your, your contact info, Brian. And uh there we go. That was the pause. And <laughs> thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you back here in September to talk more about root cause analysis and looking at events and some best practices from uh, the biopharma world. So take care. Have a great day. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.